Hello, um, and this is video number one of section 5.1. Um, so uh, this, we're gonna start eigenvalues now. Um, and maybe this has lost some meaning because I feel like I've said this before about some of the stuff we did in chapter four maybe, uh, but I really do think that this is uh, one of the most, if not the most interesting topics in linear algebra. Uh, both because of how interesting the theory behind eigenvalues are, but also the, the just enormous wide-ranging um, applications of eigenvalues. And so I actually want to start by looking at one application of eigenvalues. Uh, so I've got this example on the worksheet and I've got it on the board here. Uh, so basically in this example, we are studying a population of rabbits. Um, and we're sort of keeping track of what happens to um, a rabbit um, over its lifespan. So we've got that if we start out with so many rabbits, um, about half will survive in their first year. Um, of the half that survive from year one to year two, um, about half of those survive from year two to year three. And then in this particular population of rabbits, the maximum lifespan is three years. Um, so then, the second characteristic that uh, is sort of important to this problem, uh, during uh, year one, the rabbits produce no offspring. Uh, in year two, the rabbits produce an average of six offspring. And in year three, they produce an average of eight. So we want to study what happens to the population if we start with 12 who are in their first year, 12 who are in their second year, and 10 who are in their third year. Um, so what we can actually do is use linear algebra to study a problem like this because we can model what's going on with a vector. And so what this vector is, is a vector whose first entry, basically each numbered entry corresponds to, um, corresponds to, uh, a specific year, right? So here the first entry would be number in year one, second entry would be number in year two, and third entry would be number in year three. And so what I'm also going to do is add subscripts to these vectors to indicate which year we're looking at, right? So this vector would, in a sense, encode the population information of these rabbits in their first year. So if we wanted to now calculate the vector x sub two, Well, we could certainly do that with, um, you know, sort of just going through this process, right? So uh, first, so in order to calculate the number of rabbits in year one, well, this should be 12 times six plus 10 times eight, right? To account for the um, offspring of the rabbits in years two and three. And so in our second year, we should have 152 rabbits who are in their uh, first year. And so then of these 12 rabbits that started off in their first year here, six will survive. And of the 12 here, six will survive. And so if we start off with uh, these population levels, these will be the population levels that we reach at the end of year two. All right, so let's say we wanted to calculate the population levels at the end of year uh, 50. Right, so we'd want to calculate x sub 50. And certainly doing it the way I just did it would be a kind of a long process, right? That, you know, if we had to go through sort of that same sequence in the way I did it each time, it would take a long time. Um, but notice, I can actually define a matrix A such that a times x1 is equal to x2. Because notice, each of these numbers is just a linear function of the other two numbers, right? That is, the number here should be six times what this was plus eight times what this was. And so notice, if I want to encode that, Well, so remember, I want to 
create a matrix such that this first row times this third row gives me the number 152. And remember, what's going in the first row is 6 times what this was plus 8 times what that was. Well, the second row only depends on what the first row was, right? And that's going to be 0 0.5 times. Um, I'll write that a little bigger here. So certainly this vector equation is satisfied so far if I match those up with each other. Um, but notice now, I can do this with the second row, because notice here the second entry of this vector is just one half this entry. Well, and then the third entry is just one half my previous second entry. And so if I let A equal this matrix here, then certainly we get this relation between x1 and x2. But notice not only that, we get for any year n, we get that A times x sub n gives us the population levels in year n sub 1. And so if we wanted to find the population levels in year 50, notice we could just do a to the 50 times x sub 1. And that would give us the population levels in year, or sorry, this should be a to the 49 times x sub 1. Um, because we, right, multiplying a once gives us x2, and so multiplying a n minus 1 times would give us x sub n. So, this isn't quite dealing with eigenvalues yet. This is just sort of a cool way to like use matrices to make this problem simpler, right? Because this is a fairly easy thing to program, and maybe while calculating a to the 50 isn't extremely easy, you know, if you just told the told a computer to say multiply this matrix by itself 50 times, it could do it, in, you know, very quickly. Um, so keeping this matrix in mind. Let's look at what happens if we begin with a different starting population. So this time I'm going to start with initial population levels y1 of 16 first year rabbits, 14 second year rabbits, and one third year rabbit. Well, then we could multiply a times y1 and get the vector y2, which is equal to 64 times 16 times 4. So what is significant about this? Well, notice if we look at each of the ratios in populations, right? There's four times as many rabbits in year 1 as there are in year 2, and four times as many rabbits in year 2 as there are in year 3. And if we look at the next... Um, population count, it obeys the same ratios, right? That is each four times as many in year one compared to year two and four times as many in year two as compared to year three. And that's because notice y2 is actually just equal to a constant value four times y1. So in a sense, we've sort of found this value of four and this vector where I can preserve the ratios between the populations by, you know, sort of under this rule defined by this matrix, this vector, when multiplied by this matrix, everything gets scaled the same way. And so this is what eigenvalues are. And so we would actually say here that 4 is an eigenvalue of A with the vector y1. And so this is a specific example of eigenvalues, and so we will define those now. And so you can see certainly in this example how applying eigenvalues to this problem could be useful, especially if you wanted to maintain the ratio of um, populations. You know, so and you know you could then apply this to the study of anything where you wanted to sort of you had all of these interacting, any sort of um, scientific um, or biological system where you had 
all of these interacting parts and you wanted to preserve ratios between parts, um, certainly this would be an example of how you could, could do that. And so we say that an eigenvector of an n by n matrix A is a vector x such that when I multiply a on the left by x, or multiply a on the right by a, so a times x, um, this is equivalent to multiplying x by some scalar lambda Actually, I did miss one word here. This should be a non-zero vector x. Uh, I'll talk about why that is in a second, but um, we specifically want to specify here that our vector x is non-zero. So non-zero vector x, in this case, we call lambda an eigenvalue of A. Corresponding to x. All right, um, so as a quick aside, why did I have to make the correction to be non-zero? Uh, so if x is the zero vector, notice this problem kind of becomes trivial because here I could actually just pick any This works for any scalar c. All right, so this problem actually isn't very interesting if this is the zero vector because then this equation is always satisfied no matter what. And so in this definition, that's why we specify this vector has to be non-zero. All right, um, so a lot of applications and problems in linear algebra itself deal with answering the question, is a specific scalar an eigenvalue of a square matrix A? And is a specific vector an eigenvector of a square matrix A? So I wanna start with the latter problem of determining whether something is an eigenvector. Um, so because if we are given a matrix and an eigenvector, uh, the problem of determining if a vector is an eigenvector is relatively straightforward. So let's suppose we've got this matrix A and two vectors U equal to three negative one and V equal to negative two one. And we want to determine if u and v are eigenvectors of A. So notice by definition, what this means is that when I multiply A by u and v, if they are eigenvectors, basically this matrix multiplication should be the equivalent of just scaling all of the entries by the same constant. So we'll start with a times u. Times the vector u, three, negative one. And so notice this is equal to the vector nine minus two, seven, nine minus eight, one. And so notice here, there's no scalar I can pull out, right? So this got scaled by seven over three, this got changed by negative one, and so there's nothing I can pull out. And so I think the reason u is not an eigenvector will make a lot more sense when I show you that v is an eigenvector. So we'll do the same 
multiplication here, but with V instead of U. So now, now if we do this vector multiplication, I get negative 6 plus 2 is negative 4, and negative 6 plus 8 is 2. And so notice I can factor a constant of 2 out of this vector, and I get then that this vector here is... Um, so when I multiply this, I get a vector that's actually just a scalar multiple of the vector I started with. And so here we would say that V is an eigenvector with eigenvalue lambda equals 2. And so notice here, there's nothing I can do. I can't do the same thing with A times U, right? There's no single constant I could pull out of this matrix that would give me my original vector like I did here. So determining if something is an eigenvector is sort of a relatively straightforward problem of just multiplying the matrix in the vector and seeing, did I wind up with the scalar multiple of my original vector? Now, if I'm given a matrix and an eigenvalue or a potential eigenvalue, that problem is a little harder. Um, so I've sort of got this method outlined in the worksheet. I'd actually recommend looking at those sort of steps. I've outlined a few of them as questions um, uh, and trying to kind of work through them for, uh, for yourself, but I'll outline the method now. Um, so let's say we have an n by n matrix A. And we're going to let lambda be a scalar. And so now, if lambda is an eigenvalue of A, then we know that the following holds. So we, of course, we know that a times x is equal to lambda times x for some non-zero x. And so this means I can do the following. So I can first multiply both sides of the equation by the identity matrix. And this may seem you know, a little redundant, right? Because of course I'm not actually changing anything. But what I am doing um, is rewriting this as a matrix times a vector equals a matrix times a vector, right? So I'm allowed to factor the identity matrix through this constant. And so this means that I can actually then move this right-hand side of the equation over to get this relationship, that a times x minus this matrix lambda times i sub n times x is equal to 0. And now, by the properties of matrix vector multiplication, I can actually factor this x out. And so I get this nice relationship if x is, in fact, an eigenvector corresponding to lambda, that this matrix, which is a minus lambda times i sub n, which you'll probably eventually prefer to just think of the matrix where I start with a and subtract lambda from the diagonal values of a, as we'll see in a second, that this matrix times x is equal to 0. So this tells me a couple things, right? That if um, so, if lambda is an eigenvalue, then this matrix equation 
has a non-trivial solution x, which is an eigenvector for lambda. So if I want to determine if lambda is an eigenvalue, I can kind of do two things at once. I subtract lambda off all the diagonal entries of A, which is exactly what this matrix is. Well, we know when this matrix equation has a non-trivial solution, right? We know how to check that. And then once we've checked that, we know how to find those non-trivial solutions. And so in finding any non-trivial solution, I'll get an eigenvector for that original eigenvalue lambda. So actually determining if an eigen or a specific scalar is an eigenvalue is just a matter of solving a homogeneous matrix equation. So I want to end the video with uh, one example of this, um, or a couple examples. So we'll kind of do the same mirrored thing we did for the eigenvector checking. So we will uh, look at a couple constants. We'll see how one we can show one is, is an eigenvalue and how one isn't. And we'll work with the same matrix. So let A be the following matrix. And so we want to verify that lambda equals 9 is an eigenvalue. for A, then we want to verify that 1 is not. All right. And so oftentimes this question won't be given to you as verify that it is or isn't. We'll just say check whether or not it is. Um, but I'll show you sort of the two things you should get when looking for this. All right, so whenever we're going to check if something is an eigenvalue, what we want to do is look at the matrix A minus 9 times I sub 2. Right, so this is the matrix again that we want to check and see if there's a non-trivial solution to the homogeneous matrix equation. And so notice this matrix is equal to 3, 2, 3. Oops, sorry, here A should be 8 not 6. Um, I apologize for that. This was the matrix we were working with. Um, yes, sorry, I apologize for writing 6 there. Um, anyways, 3, 2, 3, 8 minus 9, 0, 0, 9. Right, and so as you can see, this matrix is just the matrix we obtained from A by subtracting the potential eigenvalue from all of the diagonal entries of A. And so what we want to check is for a non-trivial solution to the following matrix equation. We're here. Again, notice the matrix we're using is this modified A matrix where I subtract 9 from the diagonals. And so to do this, we can just row reduce this matrix. And so what's sort of the key here, right? If this matrix has a non-trivial solution, it should actually row reduce to a matrix with at least one zero row, right? So keep that in mind because notice that in fact, if this is an eigenvalue, right? We know this has a non-trivial solution, meaning this matrix should always be not invertible. And so keep that in mind because remember how much we learn about a matrix by knowing whether or not it is invertible. Uh, and so then one more step to finish row reducing this, we can divide row one by six and get the following matrix. And so remember, this corresponds to the following system of equations, which 
I can put this in parametric vector form times s is equal to 0 by, remember, solving for x1 in terms of the free variable x2. And so how I got from here to here, I row reduced, used the row reduced matrix that I determined now corresponded to a non-trivial solution to actually find the parametric vector form. And now notice by letting s equal 1, this is a solution to the homogeneous equation. a minus 9 times i2 times x equals 0. Therefore, 9 is an eigenvector of a. Or sorry, 9 is an eigenvalue of a with eigenvector one third one. So again, sort of recapping this, because we row reduced this matrix, got at least one row of all zeros here, or so in that case got I guess maybe the more general way of saying that is got a non-trivial solution to the homogeneous equation. Um, we found some non-trivial solution here. And it turns out this vector is an eigenvector corresponding to 9, which is, in fact, an eigenvalue. All right, so uh, I want to just end with what should you be looking for if something isn't an eigenvalue? And so just for the fun of it, before we do that, whenever we think we have an eigenvector, there's always one more way to check. What we should do is multiply this matrix times the potential eigenvector. Well, so the first entry notice is equal to 3, so 1 plus 2 is 3. 3 plus 9. And so sure enough, this is equal to 9 times 1 third 1. So 9 is, in fact, an eigenvalue. Um, right, and certainly having the eigenvector, it's a lot easier to determine. But sometimes actually finding this eigenvector can be tricky. So we want to verify that 1 is not an eigenvalue. So again, we want to calculate now the matrix A minus 1 times the identity matrix, which notice here again is just the matrix where I subtract 1 from each of the entries of A. And so now notice, row reducing this matrix, I get the identity matrix, which of course means that a minus 1 times i sub 2 times x equals 0. So the corresponding homogeneous equation has only the trivial solution. So 1 is not an eigenvalue. And so that's, again, because if any non-trivial solution, vector x here, would actually be the eigenvector. But since the only solution is to let x equal 0, as we saw, we just don't let 0 eigenvectors be a thing. So that is sort of the, um, well, that wraps up our introduction to eigenvectors. Um, so we'll continue with section 5.1 in the next video.